In this video, I'm going to start on the conversation about the antinomies of pure reason. And so these all sort of take this form here that I have at the top uh, of this syllogism here. And we see that now we are using these conditional syllogisms, the, the if-then statements. And so the, the sort of uh, broad or general syllogism here is if the condition, which is, you know, the object in need of, you know, some kind of explanation is given. Uh, so given mean that, you know, we are sort of experiencing it. It's sort of before our eyes right now. Then the whole series of all its conditions is given as well. So the condition, the object in need of ex explanation is given. So, you know, we are viewing an object right now, we're experiencing an object right now. So therefore the whole series of its conditions is given as well. And so what that means is, for instance, so if we're looking at some some object right here, you know, we're we're experiencing some object here, then when we see the object, we know that there has to have been, and so we could use maybe causality in this case, that there had to be some cause that, uh, you know, made the object what it is, and some cause that, you know, brought it to be where it is in space and time and so forth. And so, uh, and so when you see the object, sort of the things that caused it are, are, uh, you know, sort of given as well, the conditions that brought it into into being in its particular place, in its given place, uh, are sort of also given just by sort of experiencing the object. But then, you know, the things that cause the object uh, also demand explanation, ex also demand a cause. And so those ones are given. And so we end up with this whole series uh, of of conditions uh, for everything that needs to be explained, everything that needs to be conditioned, uh, sort of going, you know, all the way back in this regress. And so Kant in this section says that there are essentially two, uh, two ways that this could go. Either we could have an infinite regress, so an infinite, infinite regress. So Everything that explains this uh, also needs an explanation. Everything that explains that also needs an explanation. Everything that explains that also needs an explanation, so on and so forth. Uh, or we could have a, a terminus, a terminus where this regress stops and then that thing is, you know, what, what he calls the unconditioned condition. So it's the thing that conditions other things, but is itself unconditioned. Uh, and so if you know about, uh, you know, sort of later, well, I guess actually earlier philosophy, there is what is called the Agrippan trilemma, uh, which essentially says that every explanation uh, can either go in an infinite regress, uh, it can stop at some sort of, you know, unconditioned condition, uh, or in the uh, Agrippin trilemma, there is also, uh, it could be something circular. But for Kant, it is just the infinite regress uh, and the, the terminus. And so what Kant in this section wants to show is that both of these things uh, are, are uh, plausible. So they're sort of internally coherent, but uh, but mutually exclusive. And so he wants to pit both of these things against each other and show that both of them have an argument for why they're true. And then we, uh, because of, you know, the limitations of pure reason, uh, don't have any way of determining which one of these arguments, whether it's an infinite regress or a terminus, is actually true. And so they're, uh, they're all going to be of a form that looks like this, uh, where we have on the left side uh, the, the argument that it terminates at some single unconditioned, and on the right side that it is an infinite regress, so an entire series as a totality is the unconditioned. Uh, and so we can see here that, you know, we have the if A, where A is our sort of 
uh, unconditioned condition, then B, and then, you know, we can sort of go down the line here uh, until we get to, you know, Z, which is sort of the given. Uh, and then we say that A uh, is actually the case, and therefore we can sort of, through a series of uh, modus ponens, get to our Z. So our Z is explained uh, ultimately by A, which is, you know, the unconditioned condition. Uh, or we can have an infinite regress where we have, you know, some uh, X sub naught is our, our given. Uh, and then we have to do this regress up to, you know, up from, up to X minus one, then X minus one has to be explained by X sub minus two. We go up to here, we have, you know, X sub N, which has to be explained by X uh, sub N minus one, which has to be explained by X sub n minus 2, and then that has to keep going until we get to, you know, well, not until we get to, it'll keep going. There's some, you know, x n minus infinity, which we could say is sort of the entire series. And so, you know, we say that, you know, that a causes b causes c, but, you know, there's some cause of a in this case. But then if we look at the entire series, sort of, you know, in its entirety, this is what is actually un, unconditioned, unconditioned. And so this is sort of the way that, and Kant actually structures it like this, where he actually puts it in two different columns side by side. And so that's uh, how, how I will have it structured here. Uh, and so the, the things that Kant wants to look at are the uh, absolute completeness of the composition of the given whole of appearances, which is essentially just that uh, t uh, sort of the completeness of time and the completeness of space. And so we can think of time, so, you know, each time is conditioned since it comes after a time before it. And so we could think of each moment in time as being conditioned by, you know, the, the moment of time before that, which is conditioned by the moment of time before that, and so on. And so we can either have an infinite regress where time is infinite, or there could be a beginning of time. Uh, and then so there is also space, which, you know, each each little region of space is sort of conditioned. That's what these double-sided arrows mean. Conditioned by the areas of space all around it. And so each, you know, little section of space is conditioned by all of the space around it. And so uh, Kant says that reason seeks uh, the beginning of time or sort of the conditions of time, uh, I guess would probably be a better way to put it, and the conditions of the world. So the ultimate conditions of time uh, and the ultimate conditions of the world. Uh, and so Kant also says there is the absolute completeness of the division of a given whole in appearance, which is essentially just uh, sort of dividing an object into smaller pieces. <clears throat> and hopefully, uh, well, I guess one way or the other, we either come to the conclusion that the object can be infinitely divisible or that it is composed of some sort of ultimate simple parts. Uh, and so I've kind of put that here where we have each of these sections of some object here. Uh, so our object, which is this capital M made out of these smaller parts, then we take these smaller parts and split those into even smaller parts and so on so that, you know, the smallest parts, if that happens to be the case, conditions the next size up, which, you know, then we keep going up until we get to the whole object, which is conditioned by all of the parts smaller than it, which, you know, those parts are then conditioned by parts smaller than that. And, you know, we'll see that Kant gives arguments that it, that are valid, that are sort of internally coherent, that there are something that are the smallest objects, but also an argument that is uh, perfectly valid, that there is, that all objects can be infinitely divisible. And so Kant also uh, says that this can be used for causality as well, where, you know, there could be a first cause or there could be an infinite regress of 
causes. And so the first cause is what Kant calls the uh, absolute self-activity or freedom, because something that isn't uh, conditioned by any previous causes is something that is completely free. It's sort of outside the bounds of causality. It sort of, you know, supersedes any sort of causation and therefore is uh, perfectly free. Uh, then so there's the, uh, the absolute completeness, the dependence of the existence of the alterable in appearance, which is just sort of the idea of necessary in necessity in contingency, where uh, there is the argument that either there is just an infinite series of contingent things, or there is, you know, some ultimate necessity uh, from which you know, all other things are contingent upon, you know, so we have this thing that's contingent upon, you know, other things which is contingent upon this, which is contingent upon this, which is contingent upon this, and then uh, the absolute necessity would be the thing that uh, everything else is contingent upon, sort of, uh, sort of the transitive property of contingency here. Everything is contingent upon this necessity, but the necessity is itself necessary and therefore not contingent upon anything else. And so we can look at the sort of uh, arguments for each of these. So, like I said, Kant does a side-by-side -side comparison of the what he calls the thesis and the antithesis uh, for each of the above, where the thesis is that there is a limit at the unconditioned, so either a beginning of time, uh, a smallest object uh, from which everything is composed, so the simple, uh, the uncaused causer, and the necessary. The antithesis uh, is sort of on the side of the infinite regress, which is that time has no beginning, uh, there's no smallest object, so everything is infinitely divisible. Uh, all effects have a cause, uh, and so, you know, there is no uncaused cause. There, every effect has to have a cause, and so it becomes infinite. Uh, and then same for everything is contingent. And so what Kant wants to do is show that each one, uh, the thesis and the antithesis, are both internally coherent, but mutually exclusive. Uh, or in other words, they are antinomies of each other. Uh, so this demonstrates that we don't actually have knowledge of these things. And so uh, that's the thing to keep in mind is that Kant is not... Uh, in, is not coming down on any side of these things. In fact, what he's trying to show is that we are not warranted in coming down on either side of these arguments. So one of these is not better than the other. Uh, so they're both sort of valid. They're both internally coherent. Uh, and it's an antinomy because even though they are both valid, both of them are mutually exclusive. And so uh, we cannot say that uh, one or the other is true. And so the first conflict is uh, so about the time and space. So the thesis is that the world has a beginning in time and is limited with regard to space. The antithesis is that the world has no beginning and no limits in space, but is infinite as regards to both time and space. So the proof for the thesis is that if time were infinite, then we'd never arrive at the present uh, through successive points in time. Uh, and then sort of for space, you know, if it were infinite, then uh, we could not... Uh, come to a whole through the successive syntheses of quanta. And so this idea for time particularly is that if there's no beginning of time, then you can go infinitely, so minus infinity into the past. But then, you know, the present moment is, you know, sort of infinity into the future, you know, from, you know, this infinity into the past. And you can never reach infinity through sort of successive moments in time there because there are infinite of them and so the you know the whole sort of definition of infinity is that it's something that can never be reached because you know every time you get you know some distance there is just still more distance to go and so it's saying that the present is could never be reached because if there is an infinity into the past, then, you know, every time you move into the future, the present is, you know, still some infinite time away. And so the world must have a beginning because, you know, there is no, 
uh, if the, if it was infinite, there, you could never get to this point in time. So the, the proof for the antithesis, which is uh, equally valid. Uh, so if the world had a beginning, then there was a time prior to anything existing. But if nothing existed, then what conditions could have been that would bring about the world? So before the world existed, there was nothing. And so there was nothing that could have conditioned the beginning of the world. Uh, uh, and so, you know, without anything to condition it, the world could not have come to be. So if the world is limited in space, then everything outside it is nothingness, uh, which is not a thing, and therefore the world is, uh, is infinite. Uh, so furthermore, an unconditioned condition is impossible for us to experience uh, since the categories of the understanding are what make experience possible and the understanding conceives the world as a thoroughgoing system of cause and effect. Uh, but uh, so once again, Kant is saying that both of these arguments are perfectly valid uh, and mutually exclusive. And so therefore we can't decide between which one the thesis or the antithesis is actually correct. Uh, so the second conflict uh, is the thesis about sort of the divisibility of objects. And so the thesis is every composite substance in the world consists of simple parts uh, and nothing exists anywhere but the simple or what is composed of it. And so he's saying that there is sort of a smallest thing, that things are only finitely divisible. Uh, the antithesis, uh, no composite thing in the world consists of simple parts, and nowhere in the world does there exist anything simple. And so the proof of the thesis, so if there are no simples, so if there are no simples, so we're sort of assuming the, the opposite, then there are also no composites. Uh, but everything in existence is either a simple or a composite, and so without simples, there would be nothing. But we know that things do exist, therefore there must be symbols. Uh, additionally, substance is that which is self-subsistent. Uh, so something that, you know, sort of uh, is able to subsist without being composed of anything simpler. Uh, but if all substances at any level of division is composed of something simpler, so if everything is infinitely divisible, then a substance is not sub self-subsistent, which is a contradiction. Then the proof of the antithesis, if a symbol is something that can't be divided, but it exists in infinitely divisible space, then the simple is extended and so has parts. And so Kant is saying that we take space itself, so space, space is infinitely divisible, so infinitely uh, divisible. Uh, you know, there is no smallest unit of space. Space is infinitely divisible. But if objects exist in space and we get down to, you know, some, some, uh, some simple object, uh, but it is sort of extended in space. And so something extended can, by definition, sort of be cut into pieces. And so if space is infinitely divisible, then anything that is not, you know, without dimension uh, is something that is extended and therefore can be further divided. Uh, so, uh, so if space is infinitely divisible, then the simple is extended and so has parts, making it a composite and able to be further divided. So the procedure can be applied ad infinitum and therefore no simples exist. Uh, so once again, Kant is saying these are two equally valid arguments but that are mutually exclusive, and so we can't have knowledge of either one of them. So the third conflict of the transcendental ideas is about causality. So the thesis that causality, according to the laws of nature, uh, not only the causality, it's not only the causality from which all appearances of the world can be derived. In order to account for these appearances, it is necessary to admit another causality, that of freedom. So something that is free and able to, you know, act as a causer, but is itself uncaused. So the antith antithesis 
there is no freedom, but everything in the world takes place solely according to the laws of nature. So everything is subject to the laws of causality. So the proof of the thesis uh, is that an infinite series of cause and effect and appearances, if it's said to be said to exist, needs a cause, but being infinite, it cannot be sufficiently determined. Thus, an infinite series of cause and effect is a contradiction. Therefore, there must be a terminus of the series at, at something that doesn't need a cause, which is an absolute freedom. Furthermore, the issue of, you know, an infinite series arises uh, where we could never arrive at the current state of effect. Uh, then the proof for the antithesis is uh, if there is an absolute freedom, so if we assume uh, the opposite, then the activity of that freedom is not conditioned on any states that precede its spontaneous action. Yet we cannot experience anything that is happening without a cause. And so this is, uh, quote, an empty fiction of the mind and hence is not to be met with in any experience. Uh, so we humans must experience things as obeying laws, but absolute freedom cannot exist by obeying laws because if it's obeying laws then it's not freedom uh, well it's not absolute freedom we therefore can never experience an absolute freedom uh, and so that is uh, the third conflict about cause and effect uh, then the fourth one which has to do with uh, necessity and contingency so the thesis is uh, there belongs to the world an absolutely necessary being, uh, either as its part or as its cause. The antithesis, an absolutely necessary being exists nowhere, neither in the world nor outside the world as its cause. So the proof for the thesis, uh, every alteration or event uh, we experience presupposes the conditions that made it occur. These conditions render the alteration necessary since they are sufficient for it to occur. But these conditions are themselves conditioned. Yet there cannot be an infinite series of conditioned conditions, and therefore there must be a first unconditioned condition, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, furthermore, this absolute necessity must exist in time, since a series in time can only be conditioned by something which precedes it. Uh, so the proof for the antithesis, uh, something that is unconditionally necessary existing in the world does not have a cause which conflicts with our experience of the world and therefore cannot be the case. So we always experience things as having a cause uh, and therefore this sort of, you know, necessary being uh, is not something we could ever experience. Uh, an infinite series of conditioned conditions cannot be in a totality necessary because something made completely of contingent parts cannot be uh, itself necessary. So that's essentially saying that we have, you know, sort of the, you know, condition uh, or the contingent one, uh, the condition two, the, the, uh, the contingent three and sort of we end up with this infinite series of contingents which uh, if we say that this is itself necessary well Kant is saying that something composed completely of contingent things cannot itself be necessary and so this sort of entire series composed of contingent things uh, cannot be uh, cannot be uh, itself necessary and though therefore we can't say that that is the necessary thing. Uh, so we're ruling that out as a necessity. Uh, so the, the, the unconditioned necessity cannot exist outside the world since as a first cause must exist in time, which refutes the premise that it's uh, existing outside the world. And so the antithesis says that there is no uh, necessity, uh, including, you know, this kind of necessity here. Uh, and so once again, Kant is saying that these are sort of equally valid, but mutually inconsistent, um, mutually inconsistent uh, theses or thesis and antithesis here. Uh, and then in the next video, I will continue 
with explanations of this and uh, how Kant actually wants to try and uh, solve these antinomies.